my name is Ann Smith and I'm a volunteer with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida and I'm here today interviewing Frank Towers and the date is January 18th, 2013. And Frank, we have these wonderful interviews already in our archives from you about your service and about your life but this morning I'd like to concentrate on just your experience about liberating the train when you were in the, in the war and maybe a, a time right before that uh, so we can get a little perspective on that. Um, it seems that Yad Vashim in Israel would like that on video and might make that part of their, their museum display. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, where were you born? I was born in, in South Boston, Mass. Uh huh. And will you tell me when? When? Uh huh. Well, a long time ago. <laughs> long time ago. That's an uh, answer. Th 13 June 1917. Okay. All right. Um, well, that and, puts me almost 95. <laughs> and and I want to use you as my role model for 95. Okay. <clears throat> now, did you enlist in the army? Yes, I enlisted in 1940. Okay. And so, um, while, while much of your, your history and your audio interview has been about the early time in, in service, um, maybe you can give us just a brief uh, part about prior to going into uh, the northern part of Germany. And you can tell us, now you, were, you landed, um, uh, on what date and, mm. and prior to Normandy? Okay, we were training in England uh, in the early part of 1944. Okay. And on the 13th of June, we sailed across the channel and landed on Omaha Beach. And it just happened that that was my birthday. I was 26 years old. Mm. So that was the biggest reception that I had ever gotten. <laughs> mm -hmm. Happy birthday <laughs> not, to you. Not, not a very happy one no, at that, no. that point. And uh, I've never had such a big reception before, uh, since that time. Uh, after landing uh, on Omaha Beach, uh, we fought our way uh, very vigorously down through Normandy and uh, across northern France uh, into Belgium. Holland and to the border of Germany, uh, arriving there around the 1st of October uh, 1944. Uh, now prior to all of this, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we had heard some and read of propaganda in mm -hmm. the local newspapers here in the States and during our service <coughs> in uh, the Stars and Stripes uh, newspaper. Uh, about the torture of some Jews in Germany. Uh, we, we couldn't really believe what we were reading because it was very uh, uh, graphic about the uh, conditions that they were uh, being required to live under. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we just dismissed it as propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, coming into France, and across northern France. Uh, we saw none of that, but yet we're still reading in the newspapers the propaganda uh, mm -hmm. about these Jews being tortured in concentration camps and uh, the severe living conditions yes. under which they had to endure. Uh, so we, we just basically dismissed uh, most of that and continuing uh, uh, fighting uh, into Germany uh, we got into the western part of Germany and uh, <clears throat> were uh, going around the, the northern part of the Ruhr industrial area mm -hmm. of Germany, which was the heart of the industrial uh, part. And uh, <clears throat> still, we saw no such thing as concentration camps. What was your job, Frank? What At that time, my job was a liaison officer. Now, what does a <clears throat> liaison officer do? Uh, my, my job uh, entailed uh, a glorified messenger boy, really, uh, carrying messages and orders from our division headquarters 
to our regimental headquarters mm -hmm. and preparing for the battle for the next day. I see. And uh, I continued on that role uh, through, the, through the end of the war. Okay. We came to the Rhine River in mid-March and did our crossing on the 23rd and 24th of March, still not seeing any concentration camps. Continued on toward uh, Brunswick, mm -hmm. which was a large industrial city, and uh, arriving there and liberating Brunswick on the 10th of April. Mm -hmm. We saw nothing about concentration camps. We had uh, come across a few camps which were designated as displaced persons camps. Yes. Uh, they were uh, various nationalities uh, herded up into, into small camps and used as slave laborers in various places. We came across two or three American and British uh, prisoner of war camps uh, which were uh, very emotional in meeting some of our uh, American colleagues uh, mm -hmm. who had been taken prisoner back in the early days of the war and uh, of course they were liberated. Some of the British uh, airmen, American airmen, mm -hmm. uh, who had been captured some years uh, before in the really? early days of the bombing of, of Germany and uh, so they had endured imprisonment for three, four years. Had their so, treatment been well? Not well. They, they were fed very poorly mm -hmm. and required to march from camp to camp uh, yes. to keep them out of the, the range of uh, the American forces and, and bombing. Mm -hmm. uh, now after the uh, liberation of, Ma of uh, Brunswick, mm -hmm. uh, our next major objective was the city of Magdeburg. Mm -hmm. Magdeburg was a city of about 200,000 people on the Elbe River. As we were advancing toward Magdeburg, the 743rd Tank Battalion, which is a part of our division, encountered a train loaded with prisoners. At this point in time, we didn't know who they were or what they were but we found that this was a train load of 2,500 Jews who had been, were being transported from Bergen-Belsen mm -hmm. to Theresienstadt, which is on the Czech border. I see. Theresienstadt was a notorious extermination camp, which uh, they were uh, heading for, for the final solution. And why had they stopped? They stopped because the bridge at Magdeburg had been bombed out and they couldn't get across the river. So they had backed up and were in waiting at this little town of Farsleben, uh, waiting for further orders as to what to do mm -hmm. with these Jews. Mm -hmm. The last orders that they had received was for the engineers to drive the train onto the bridge that had been blown up and just drive it off the end of the blown out bridge, thereby drowning all of these 2,500 people or killing them, one of the others. Very fortunately, the engineers had a little bit of brains and they said, hey, if we do this, we're going to. So we don't want to do that. So they got into a dispute and they're actually in this dispute at the time we encountered them really? and upset their plans yes. and, uh, and liberated these, uh, these uh, Jews. Can you describe what you saw initially? Well, uh, I was not among the first group to be there. I didn't actually see them until the next day. Uh -huh. But uh, even when I had arrived there at that time, uh, they had still had not unloaded all of these people from these cars. They, they were in cattle cars. Now, these cattle cars were a little bit smaller than our freight cars that we have here today. And they were um, basically remnants, leftovers from World War I, which we call 40 and 8s, meaning that they would transport 40 men or eight horses. Yes. That was the mode of transportation in those days. Yes. So in those cars, they had jammed 75 or 80 Jews. 
At the end of the car, there was one or two passenger cars in which they put some of the older people and uh, young ladies who had small children. Mm -hmm. They were the fortunate ones to be in the, in the passenger car because whenever the train stopped, they could dismount and get a little exercise or relieve themselves, whatever they needed to do. However, the, uh, uh, this train of about 40 cars uh, was loaded with 75 people in each car. Uh, they had been in this train for six days. They were allowed out of that train once a day in the evening to be fed. Their meal consisted of probably a cup of water, if they were lucky, and a cup of soup. And the soup was made or was a, uh, a kettle of water with some potato peelings or turnip peelings in there. And they're real lucky if they got some of the potato peelings in their cup full of soup. So that was their nourishment per day for six days. And then they're herded back into these cars to move on to another location uh, on, on their route to, to Theresienstadt. What were they wearing? They were wearing civilian clothes. They're, they were not in the typical prison uh, clothing that we normally see in pictures mm -hmm. of the, uh, the Jewish prisoners. They, these were, uh, <clears throat> the, the, most of the people uh, at Bergen-Belsen were poli political type uh, prisoners mm -hmm. and were being held uh, for exchange in Switzerland for German prisoners that we were holding. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course that, that never came about, so these people were still being held at Bergen-Belsen. Uh, Bergen-Belsen actually was in the British territory. Mm -hmm. So as the British Army was approaching, they wanted to get these Jews out of there so that they would not see the condition that yes. they were in. Yes that uh, they knew that the stories had gotten out about the torture and the, the bad living conditions that they were under and uh, being mal-fed, uh, malnourished. Uh, so they did not want the British troops to see the condition of these people. So they loaded them onto three different trains and were sending them to Theresienstadt. And this was one of the trains that we, we intercepted after they got into the American zone. Mm -hmm. So this were we had custody of them at that time. So we began to get their story about where they had come from. Many of them were from Poland, uh, Austria, Hungary, Romania, uh, most of the Eastern Bloc uh, countries, some of them were from Russia. And the uh, cars were locked, is that right? Uh, yeah, the, the cars were locked. They, they couldn't get out at, at will. So once they had been fed in the evening, they were put back in the cars and locked. And is there room to sit down or? There was not room. They were in there like sardines. And if they could not stand, they crumpled to the floor. And that's where they stayed because the people just could not shuffle no. around and move them. So actually when we found the train, uh, there were only six dead in, in the cars. Uh, unfortunately, en route during the six days <clears throat> that they, they had been traveling to Farsleben. Many of them did die, mm -hmm. and they were buried along the track oh. as they went along each day. They would take the bodies out and bury them there. So mm -hmm. by the time they got to, to Farsleben, there were no dead bodies except the six, and uh, there were uh, about a dozen or more cases of typhus uh, among them. Mm -hmm. uh, which was a very communicable disease. So when the doors of the cars were opened, we're going back just a moment, uh, the condition of the people in the cars, for sanitary purposes, mm -hmm. they had a bucket, one of these five gallon buckets in the corner of the car. Now you can imagine the guy over in this corner wanting to get to that corner to relieve himself. There was no way. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? The obvious thing, they just let it run down their legs. Yes. So if you can imagine six days of that, yes. they were filthy, mm -hmm. stinking. 
There was a straw on the floors. That was the bedding. Of course, they had no room to sit or lay down anyway. Mm -hmm. But the lice had infested the straw and had gotten on the bodies of the people. Sure. So they were infested. Their, their hair was infested with lice, uh, fleas. Uh, we, it, we didn't know what kind of communicable diseases they might have. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were very reluctant to touch them. They, they wanted to reach out and shake hands with us and hug us and kiss us. Uh, we kind of had to rebel and, and not do that. Yeah. But we did see, and, and we could understand from their very broken English, a few of them could speak a little bit of English, we could understand what their situation was. They were hungry. And uh, so we had our pockets full of candy and cigarettes and yes. apples and you name it, our pockets were stuffed full of it. Yes. And uh, so we began giving this stuff to them. And no sooner did we give them this food, then they, they threw it up. Uh, sure. their, their bodies uh, could not assimilate the rich protein food that we were giving them. We were making them in worse condition than they were. Yeah. So we had to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the medics uh, came, uh, treated those uh, who needed immediate care. Now, uh, they were being guarded before you got there. I'm sorry? Who were their guards? They had a, uh, a captain and 12 German uh, soldiers. With the, they had the guards. Mm -hmm. And they had, uh, in the middle of the train, uh, one of the cars had some anti-aircraft guns on it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, normally, our Air Force uh, flying around in the area, whenever they saw a train moving, they would go down and strafe it or bomb it. and. Uh, they, they were reluctant to do that because they knew that these Jews were being moved around, yes. but they could not tell the trains that had the Jews in them no. or German soldiers and German supplies. So they had to be very careful about their strafing and bombing of these cars, although the, each one of the trains had these anti-aircraft guns on it to, to try to uh, shoot down mm -hmm. our American planes that were attacking it. So that was the only protection that they had but uh, getting back to your question, uh, yes, they, they had the, this captain and, uh, and 12 soldiers were guarding them. Now, as soon as we Americans appeared on the scene, mm -hmm. the soldiers realized that, that they were outnumbered and they immediately uh, threw their rifles down and began, began taking their uniforms off and begging the uh, civilian, the Jews, to give them some of their clothing, oh. that they could be become civilians, not soldiers. Mm -hmm. Didn't make any difference to us whether they were civilian or soldier. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. we knew, they knew who the soldiers were. Sure. So they pointed them out and of course they were almost immediately rounded up and, and captured mm -hmm. and uh, taken to, as, as prisoners. But uh, they, they tried to avoid uh, mm -hmm. being taken. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the people were sort of segregated out. Uh, the, uh, the people who were uh, near death, there was no point in trying to save them. And then those who were salvageable and those who were the, the walking wounded. And uh, it became my assignment at that time to round up as, much, uh, as many vehicles as I possibly could mm -hmm. to move these people out of here. Mm -hmm. because this was in, in the middle of a battle zone. We had artillery coming in from the Americans, we had artillery coming in from the Germans. Mm. So it was, we didn't want to have any more casualties than, than would be possible. So uh, I was designated to move them from Farsleben back to the town of Hillersleben, which we had liberated the day before. I see. Now in Hillersleben, there was a uh, a large airport and a research, German research facility. Mm -hmm. And there were several large barracks there and several homes where the officers lived and a hospital. So this was the ideal place to move these people back because it had been evacuated. There's nobody there. Sure. So we took them back uh, to this uh, facility at, at Hillersleben. 
And uh, the engineers uh, almost immediately set up shower points for these people. Uh, the first thing we had them do was to strip off all of their clothing. It was so infested with feces, urine, lice, that there was no way that it could be salvaged. Mm -mm. It was just put into a pile and burned. Yeah. And then they were sent through showers. We set up several shower points. Uh, they were very hesitant about doing that because they had heard about in other camps that their uh, other families had been sent into the showers and it turned into gas. Yes. They were gassed and then, then cremated. And they were very hesitant about going in our showers. So some of our soldiers had to lead the way and go into the showers ahead of them mm -hmm. to show that, hey, this is this is really a, sh uh, mm -hmm. a for real a, a shower. Mm -hmm. So they were given soap and uh, towels and uh, able to, to scrub themselves down as best they could. And then they were dusted with DDT, of all things. At that time, DDT was the best known uh, insecticide that would kill the lice. Mm -hmm. That's right. And they, they, we just had to saturate them yes. with, with the DDT. Uh, to my knowledge, none of them ever died from <laughs> that yeah. episode of being yeah. dusted with DDT, but although it is supposed to be a very uh, sure. uh, carcinogenous uh, right. product today and is, is prohibited on, on use like that. But uh, nevertheless, it was the best thing we had. Sure. So uh, immediately, uh, we required the, uh, the burgomaster to get orders out to his people to bring clothing and food uh -huh. to take care of these people. Were they willing to do that? Were the Germans? Uh, reluctantly, they, they did. Because these were Jews. These are the people they hated. And that, that's, that was the whole system, the, the Nazi system. Get rid of the Jews. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were very reluctant to, to be nice, mm -hmm. uh, do anything for them. But uh, they, they uh, saw that they were slightly outnumbered. They had a few hundred thousand American soldiers against them. So they, uh, they reacted uh, mm -hmm. in an appropriate way. Uh, bringing clothing and food uh, to the area. So they were uh, reclothed and fed uh, very uh, small rations, but frequently yeah. during the day. Yeah. Those people who had uh, families uh, were assigned to the houses that the uh, mm -hmm. German officers had occupied previously. And of course, the single uh, people were assigned to the barracks. Sure. And, uh, of course, at, at this point, uh, my, my job was done, delivering them to the, the barracks. And, uh, you know, I basically bid them goodbye and good luck, and uh, I got my job to do and finish fighting the war. So I rejoined my unit, and uh, then we, we attacked Magdeburg. And uh, Magdeburg was a large city situated on the Elbe River. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had crossed the river and gone about 15 miles uh, towards Berlin. And uh, we actually had the maps all the way to Berlin, including maps of Berlin. Then we got the word that this was to be Russian territory. So we had to withdraw back on the west bank of the Elbe River. I see. And uh, th this was heartbreaking to us because uh, we thought we were going to be the heroes and march into Berlin, yes. which we had captured uh, a German uh, general, uh, General Dittmar, uh, and he had offered to surrender the entire garrison of troops between us and Berlin. Oh, really? We could have walked into Berlin oh, really? without firing a shot, but no, this was Russian territory. We had to back out and let them go in there, oh. and they destroyed, devastated everything in their path. So they had to fight for everything that they got, and we could have walked in there. But this was a political decision that was made, and uh, had we known that, we probably wouldn't, wouldn't have fought so hard toward right. the end. Yeah. But anyway, uh, well, uh, we... Uh, uh, liberated uh, Magdeburg on the 18th of April, <clears throat> and uh, then we just sat there waiting for the Russian troops 
to come up in front of us and continue on to Berlin. And then, of course, then the end of the war came the 8th of May. And uh, then we started our uh, uh, reorganization, uh, occupation of, of the, the area. And uh, the 30th Division had then been designated to go to the Pacific to yeah. finish fighting the war down there. Uh -huh. So we, uh, in, in August, we stayed there until August and uh, moved back to England and started uh, deploying back to the States. And uh, they dropped, we, we dropped the atomic bomb on Japan. So that, in effect, ended the war in the Pacific. Yes. And so there was no need for us to, to go to the Pacific. So we came home and our unit was uh, deactivated and we went back to civilian life from that point. I had one question about, um, did you have any papers or any documents from that train as to who was on the train? Yes. <clears throat> the, uh, the Germans were uh, very meticulous about keeping records. And everything that happened, they had a record of it. They had your name, rank, and serial number, and, and everything about you. Uh, when the train was loaded at Bergen-Belsen, they made a list of all the people who were on that train, giving their place of birth and their date of birth. Wow. And uh, so uh, in recent years, uh, I have been able to obtain a copy of that list from the Bergen-Belsen oh, Memorial really? Museum. Uh -huh. And through that list, going by birth dates, I was able to de determine that there were about 700 children on that train, mm -hmm. ranging in ages from, from zero to, to 21 years. Those, that was the group that I, I targeted. Yes. Because anyone over 21 years old, uh, at this point in time, they're, they're in all probability are deceased. Mm -hmm. So this, this funneled my research uh, down to 700. Statistically, we must assume that half of those people are dead by, by now because of age and malnutrition. Mm -hmm. So this brings our total down to the possible 350 survivors of that train. And uh, I put an article in my website uh, about this uh, incident, about the incident at Farsleben, and I call it the, the death train at Farsleben. Yes. Uh, the first hit that I got was from a lady in Australia. Really? She saw my website uh -huh. and she contacted me. And from that time on, the ball just began to roll and up to now I've, I've found 235 of these children. That uh, is incredible. At the time of the liberation at Hillersleben, they were, all of their documentation, all of th their whole life was handled by the American military government and the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of those survivors were given the choice of where they wanted to go. Yes. Uh, of course, those from Poland had no place to go because Poland had totally been destroyed. Yeah. It was now occupied by the Russians yeah. and they didn't want to go back mm -mm. under Russian mm -mm. control. And there was nothing there. Their families had all been destroyed, sure. and the homes had been destroyed. Uh, others uh, came from Hungary. Uh, they wanted to go back to their homes in Hungary. Uh, many of them wanted to go to Palestine. Yes. Uh, back in the, that was before the State of Israel was formed. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, they wanted to go to, to Palestine and, and form their, their country. Their nation. So in the years preceding the war, in the early 30s, many of these Jews were far-sighted and they saw the handwriting on the wall when Hitler came into power, mm -hmm. what was going to be happening. <clears throat> and they started procuring passports to get out of wherever they were to some other neutral country, mostly to South America. Mm -hmm. But they got passports to Great Britain, United States, Canada, Australia, all over the world. And uh, 
So the American military government honored these documents and made arrangements to send these people to whatever uh, country that they had a passport for. Mm -hmm. Those who had no passport, then they went to Israel or to, to Palestine. I see. And uh, that's why they were scattered all over the world Everywhere. today. So like I got to say, this first lady was from, from Australia. I have found uh, survivors in Chile, Argentina, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mexico, the United States, Canada, Great Britain. What is their response, Frank, when you contact them? What that, do they want to know? Uh, they, they were just uh, emotionally enlightened, uh, happy that they had found one of their liberators. Yes, yeah. yes. It, it, it's hard to describe. Uh, my, my first uh, communication uh, with this lady in, in Australia, I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with Skype? Yes. Okay, she had Skype. Uh -huh. So we were able to talk face to face. Oh, how wonderful. After, after 65 years. Sure. See. And uh, it was a very emotional uh, conversation that I had with her. I'm sure. And of course many others, and uh, it's the same way. Uh, I have another one right now in San Diego that I communicate with Skype uh, quite a bit. I have a, uh, a lady in Israel, that her, her father was one of these survivors. And uh, he, he doesn't speak English, and she speaks fairly good English, so mm -hmm. we communicate quite a lot. Oh, in fact, she yeah. was the lady who arranged the reunion for me in, in Israel uh, a year ago when I went over there. Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, um, I, I had found her father, and uh, although he could not speak very good English, he did call me on the telephone. and. Uh, he, he saw my thing in the, on the website, uh -huh. and uh, he was so happy to, to find one of his liberators. Yes. Well, then the daughter took over the conversation, and uh, things just sort of ro uh, rolled uh, on from there that uh, we talked, and uh, she knew of a few other friends of her father who yes. had been on that train, other survivors. Yes. And uh, then they, in turn, knew other people, and it just sort of snowballed. and. Uh, we, we found, we found uh, I think, about 100 there in, in Israel. And uh, so she got them together, or, or communicated with them, and arranged mm -hmm. to have this reunion. They brought me over there, and then brought those people into, the, uh, into Rehovot at the Weissman Institute. And uh, then I spoke to these people at that point. Oh, was, wonderful. As I mentioned before, that there was about 60 actual survivors, yes. plus their families there at the, at the oh, reunion. That's wonderful. You know. How so it's a very, very emotional uh, time. And uh, here in the States, uh, uh, I have a colleague up in New York uh, who was a, uh, a history teacher. And he um, was very much interested in World War II and specifically the Holocaust. Sure. And, uh, this this was kind of how the whole thing got started was through him I see. really because he had given his class an assignment to go out in the in the town and see if you can find a veteran who had anything to do with the holocaust during world war 2 yes so the the children did that and they came back in with their reports and I met the, this veteran who had done this and who had done that uh, but this one boy came in and he had a very strange story that he was tell, told a story that his grandfather was one of those who had contacted the Holocaust and he had liberated a trainload of Jews at Farsleben. And so the teacher was very much interested in it and he said, well, could your grandfather come in and talk to the class about this, Yes. which he did. Carol Walsh, he was a tank commander in the 743rd Tank Battalion. Uh -huh. And uh, up to that point in time, I never knew Carol Walsh. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and had never met him before. Uh, so he, he came into the school and, and t talked to the students. And uh, then the, the teacher uh, picked up on that and got in with my website, and he created a website uh, teaching History Matters. Oh, yes. And uh, that really set the thing off. And because he, he had uh, 
children who were professional uh, uh, video people and uh, website people. I, I'm just a, a novice hack at it. <laughs> and uh, so they, they set up this uh, very nice uh, website and that got a lot of word out and oh, we bet. created a lot, of, uh, found a lot of people through his website. So we had a reunion up at his school at, at Hudson Falls, New York. Oh, how wonderful. In uh, 2008. Really? And we invited several of the survivors who lived in the New York area. Oh, sure. And uh, so we had, I think we had six of the survivors from there uh, come to uh, our reunion. And of course, that was the first time that I had met any of these uh, people. And uh, then again, I was invited up to New York to Rhinebeck to a uh, Jewish retirement uh, community. Oh, yeah. And uh, there was about a hundred uh, senior citizens there at this uh, retirement facility I spoke to them and uh, met another survivor there. My goodness. Uh, then I met a, a, a son of a survivor who lived in nearby town and he heard about it and he came to this uh, talk that I was giving. So I, I met, through him, I met his uh, parents who live in Amsterdam. And they have a condo down here in Boca Raton. Oh, <laughs> what a small world. And uh, it, it, everything just seemed to, to sm snowball together. Uh, going back just a little bit, when we liberated Magdeburg, uh, at Magdeburg, there was a, an ammunition factory, the Pulte Ammunition Factory. Mm -hmm. And they had a small Jewish slave labor camp there, which was a part of Buchenwald. Oh. There was a subcamp yeah. of Buchenwald. Yes. So we liberated that. Now in 2000, I think it was in 2000, I got an email from a young girl in Magdeburg who was going to the university and had as her thesis the liberation of Magdeburg. And everything she found was that the Russians had come in and liberated Magdeburg. Really? Well, what had happened, we liberated Magdeburg on the 18th of April. We stayed there for about two weeks and turned it over to the British. That became a part of the British zone at that time. About two weeks later, politically, that changed again, and that became a part of the Russian zone. So the British moved out and the Russians moved in. When they came into Magdeburg, they went into their archives and libraries, schools, and destroyed everything in there that was in English or anything that referred to English. Yes. Magdeburg became a Russian city. Magdeburg was liberated by the Russians. The small children before kindergarten, kindergarten and on up, were all taught the Russians liberated Magdeburg. That was their history. So this is what this girl was reading. Sure. But somehow, a friend of hers had a book. And in, in there was a passage about the, the American army having liberated Magdeburg. So she saw my website, and she got in contact with me and wanted to know if it was true, yeah. if the Americans had liberated Magdeburg. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, uh, I, I responded back to her, sent her a lot of documentation showing how the Americans had moved in there on the 18th of April, 16th to the 18th of April and liberated Magdeburg, and then the Russians took over. So she was very happy about that, and uh, so her dissertation gave her a PhD uh, there at the university, and she went to the city uh, burgomaster, mayor, and uh, told him about this, this story that Magdeburg had really been liberated by the Americans. Now in the year 2005, Magdeburg was celebrating its 1200th anniversary and at the same time, 
Simultaneously, it was liberating the 60th anniversary of their liberation. Now somehow, they had gotten in contact with a former slave laborer that had been at this Pulte Ammunition Works that lives down here in Boca Raton. And they had invited him to come to Magdeburg uh -huh. to tell his story about sure. his uh, imprisonment and incarceration and his work there in, um, in Magdeburg. And by the same token, the mayor invited me to come to Magdeburg to tell the story of the liberation from the American viewpoint. And this is 2005? I'm sorry? 2005? In 2005, correct. So I went over, and this man, Ernest Kahn, he, he went over with his wife, and we were billeted in the same hotel, had, had a beautiful suite, each one of us, uh, we were the guests of the city for a whole week. But the next morning after our arrival and a little bit of rest, we went to the, uh, the city opera house, I guess it was, which was the largest facility in, in Magdeburg at that time, to speak to about 2,000 people. Mm. Went up on the stage and uh, I was designated to speak first. And here's this other man sitting over here. I didn't know who he was or what he was doing there, but so be it. So I began to talk about our liberation of Brunswick and moving on to, to Forest Leben and then coming to Magdeburg and liberating Magdeburg. And this guy gets up out of his chair and he comes over and gives me a bear hug. You are my liberator. You are the first liberator I have ever met. And here we stand, like a couple of clowns, crying and hugging. It's very emotional that I was the first liberator that he had ever met, and he was the first uh, so prisoner, yes. Uh, yes. Jewish prisoner that I had ever met, really. How powerful. So what, what a, uh, an emotional scene that was in front of all these people. In front of 2,000. <laughs> yeah, so after we, we gained our composure and spoke a little bit, uh, he went back to his seat and I went on with my story. Then he, he could speak very fluent German, naturally. He had been born in Berlin. Oh, sure. And he, he could speak very fluent German. So he, he gave his speech in German, which was very nice. Uh, I had an interpreter uh, interpreting uh, for me because the most of the people could not understand English. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the very beginning uh, of our coming together. After we came home, we were home about a week I think, and Ernest sent me an email, look at this website. And it was this teacher up in New York teaching History Matters. Really? So it, and I, and I started reading this, this story about the, the, the train at Magdeburg. I, Damn, that, that's my story. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so I read the whole thing. That it was exactly my, my whole story that I have just related to you here now. Isn't that so this is the story that, uh, that Carol Walsh uh, had given to yes. this teacher, Matt Roselle, up in Hudson Falls, New York, the year or so before. It's amazing. So this is how the whole thing uh, started and uh, has evolved it's just uh, to, to where we are today. And uh, it, it's been a very uh, rewarding experience to me uh, to, to know that I had a small part to play in liberating these people and sending them on the road to liberty and freedom yes. and a new life. Uh, one of the girls that we liberated, uh, Lily Cohen, uh, she was from uh, Krakow in Poland. Yes. Her parents had been uh, exterminated. She didn't know exactly where she was born. She didn't know when she was born. Mm -hmm. So arbitrarily, she took April the 13th, 1945, as her birth date, and Farsleben as her birthplace. Sure. <laughs> she, she didn't know. Sure. Yeah. 
So she is still living. She, she's living in Tel Aviv today. I, I met her when I was over in Rehoboth. Uh, of course, I, I, I saw these people, you know, as a mass of people in 1945. I didn't know any one of them. No. And uh, of course, I probably saw her as, as a little child at the time, and she's just another another one of these Jews. It mm. didn't, didn't make any difference to me mm. who they were. But uh, to realize that, that, that they've all been put on the road to liberty and freedom, and uh, that I would say, uh, 75 or 80 percent of them have become high-level professional people today. Really? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? We have doctors, lawyers, engineers, chemists, pharmacists, uh, neurosurgeons, electrical engineers, you name it. They're in every profession. Uh, I got an e email from a, a, a one uh, yesterday. He's up in New York. Uh, he's a uh, uh, bioenvironmental engineer. He's a professor at uh, New York, um, the New York College in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And then you um, you gave a presentation maybe last year in Savannah. Yeah, well, we had an annual reunion in, in Savannah of our 30th division. I see. And we invited some of the uh, the Holocaust survivors uh, to come and join with us. We I had, uh, see. We had six of them come and join with us there. The uh, article I read said that it was the the most exciting day of their lives yes, to yes. come to that. Yeah, because they, they had met you know several other 30th uh, division members yes. uh, who, who were involved in, in some them. part of this. Yeah. Yes. But uh, I, I've, I've tried to, uh, to uh, talk with many of our 30th Division people, <clears throat> and, and none of them remember the, the, uh, the train experience at all. They had other jobs to do uh, over here or over here, and they weren't directly involved with the, with the train situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so until just recently, this Carol Walsh and I were the only two surviving veterans of the 30th who actually had hands-on experience mm -hmm. with these people. Yes. Now Carol just passed away about a month ago. Oh really? And uh, so I'm, I'm now the only surviving veteran who had hands-on experience with these 2,500 Jews in April 1945. Yeah. And I can't believe how close to the end of the war it was. Yes. And yeah. all of the circumstances yeah. that just yeah. made it happen yeah. the way it did. Yeah. See, uh, we were trained here in the states to fight a war. Yes. We we weren't fi uh, trained to do any human humanitarian work yeah. and saving all these uh, so-called Jews that were being tortured. That that was not our job. Mm -hmm. We, do, we never heard anything about that in our training. Mm -hmm. What if you come across a bunch of people that are starving to death? What do you do? We, we weren't trained for that. No. If we come across a bunch of people, see, we'll give them some food. Yeah. Whatever we, whatever we could do at the moment, whatever we came across, mm -hmm. we did what we could. One human being to another. Yeah. But we weren't trained to, if you come across a, t a train load of Jews, this is what you're supposed to do. Give them this medical care, and then you're supposed to give them very little bit of food, very little bit of water at a time. None of that. Yeah. We had to do what we had to do as best we thought at the time. When you think back on that whole experience, what, what, what's your takeaway message to yourself? Well, of course, the, the message I, I try to give to the, the young people today when I, I speak to them is to, to be aware uh, of the uh, situation that brought this Holocaust about. Uh, Hitler arising up from nowhere and, and taking over mm -hmm. entire Europe. Mm -hmm. Don't let this happen again. Mm -hmm. You have to be alert. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, there are neo-Nazis uh, in Europe today. There's neo-Nazis here in the United States. That's right. And uh, like uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, right. the guy there in, in Libya, they, they, they were on the way to right. rising up to power uh, 
to take over the, the country, to take over their uh, continent, to take over the world, That's like right. Hitler was. That's right. And, and it's up to the younger generation to prevent this from happening. That's right. Yeah. Well, Frank, um, thank you so much for doing this. Um, what I'd like to do now is maybe, uh, maybe we could focus on your map mm -hmm. and you could tell us a little bit more about uh, the situation so that we can get our bearings okay. with that. Yeah. Hold on. Just now, in 1944, uh, we were in training in England uh, on the south coast. We did not know when D-Day was going to occur, and we were just waiting from day to day and training in all, all of us there doing maneuvers. And suddenly, one night, we heard a tremendous drone of airplanes going overhead, and they were going from north to south. And this continued on well after midnight. So we knew then that the D-Day invasion was on. It was not until, of course that was on 6th June, and it was not until the uh, 10th of June that we went to Southampton into the marshalling area where we were confined for another three days boarded our ships and sailed across the channel to Omaha Beach. Now the, the battalion that I was with was on one ship and we got mixed up in our ships, in the shipping lanes out here somewhere and we landed at Utah Beach by mistake. So after we got off of the ship then it was determined we were at the wrong beach. So we had to reboard the ship and sail over to Omaha Beach. Oh it's only at a distance of about 40 miles, but we lost about six hours mm -hmm. going to Utah Beach and reloading and going over to Omaha Beach. From Omaha Beach, uh, we landed there on the 13th of June. Now this was a week after the actual invasion uh, on the beach, we saw a lot of the wreckage of the vehicles and equipment that had been uh, damaged by the Germans uh, on the beaches during the time of the invasion. And uh, they had pushed inland uh, about five or ten miles in places. So we wedged in to the, uh, the front line and continued fighting on down through uh, the large city of St. Lo then to Mortain. We had a large battle at uh, Mortain which lasted about six days and uh, that broke the back of the, of the German army and uh, in, in this area uh, there were two German armies about 200,000 men trapped that we had closed the bag around them and there was just one little passageway left and a lot of them did escape through there but nevertheless they were on the run back through France north of Paris in a northeast direction up through uh, Cambrai, Tournay, into Belgium, and then likely in, uh, into, uh, into Holland, the very southern tip of Holland, Limburg province. Now all the rest of the uh, Holland, in this northern area and most of Belgium, were in the British zone, so we did not liberate that part of the country. Uh, the rest of the Netherlands was not actually liberated, believe it or not, until the 5th of May, 1945. Now we were fighting down in, in Aachen, and from there we went down into an area in Belgium, the Malmody, the Battle of the Bulge in the winter of 44-45. Mm -hmm. It was the, at that time, the coldest winter on record. 
we had many days that the temperature did not get above 20 below zero. Oh. Now, if you can imagine existing in and fighting a battle in weather at 20 below zero, it, it was tremendous. We had more casualties from the cold, from frostbite, than we did from enemy action. Mm -hmm. After the uh, Battle of the Bulge ended the, uh, the 1st of February, we reverted back into, into Germany where we had been before and moved up north around the, the industrial area of the Ruhr. And then across northern Germany to the city of Brunswick. And uh, Brunswick is right in this area here. Now we're talking about the, uh, the concentration camp. Now this Bergen-Belsen is located here at, at the town of Selly, uh, which is in the, in, the, in the British zone. And they had taken this uh, people and loaded them on a train and moved them down to Magdeburg, where the Elbe River, and were crossing it and going over to uh, Theresienstadt on the uh, Czechoslovakian border. But the, uh, the, the bridge had been blown out here at Magdeburg, so the train could not cross. So they backed up to the little town of Farsleben, and this is where we found the train. Mm -hmm. And from there, I moved the people back to this town of, of Hillersleben. And uh, that was the, the end of the, uh, the Holocaust uh, encounter that we had uh, for us. And uh, then as we moved into Magdeburg, that was the end of the war. So the uh, <coughs> area of Farsleben and Hillersleben are the, the main uh, focal points of my talk about the liberation of these 2,500 Jews. Do you want to ask him about his hat <coughs> and some of his pins? <laughs> sure. <laughs> that hat looks like it's got so much metal on it, I don't know how you put it on your head. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, kind of heavy. <coughs> that, that's got all my uh, uh, battle honors on there. Uh, first, my uh, rif cross rifle to indicate that I'm in the infantry. Uh, this was a presidential unit citation that we got for uh, our, our, the Battle of Mortain down here. Uh, I have a bronze star for meritorious service, Purple Heart, for, uh, for two wounds that I received, and uh, the American Defense Medal for being in service prior to 1940, and uh, a combat infantry badge to indicate that I have been in contact with the, uh, the enemy. And here I have my, my regimental uh, insignia, the 120th Regiment and the uh, American campaign to show my service in the United States, and the European campaign, service in uh, Europe, and the Victory Medal, and the Occupation Medal, German Occupation Medal, and this meritorious unit uh, citation that we received. And uh, of course my main logo here, uh, the Old Hickory, the O and the H for Old Hickory, Old Hickory was the nickname of Andrew Jackson, our seventh president of the United States, who was born uh, on the border of uh, Tennessee and North Carolina. It's rather uh, disputed, but uh, the, the 30th Infantry Division National Guard was formed of men from Tennessee, North and South Carolina. Mm. So they took the name of Andrew Jackson uh, as their mentor. And then in the middle of the uh, uh, logo are the three X's, the Roman numeral 30 for the 30th Division. So we, we have a, a proud heritage. We uh, uh, did fight in, in World War I uh, as a uh, <clears throat> an aside. Uh, in this area, right in through here, is, is Cambrai, Roy, uh, was the site of the 
the Battle of the Somme in World War I. And the 3rd Division did a lot of liberating in this particular area, and we marched through that same area in World War II. <coughs> so. All right. Thank you again. Thank you again. Ta -da.